All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about a gait analysis for a kind of weekend warrior athlete. Scott wouldn't mind me telling Tony that he's a weekend warrior. He may have been a pro at one time. Uh, but this guy had back pain, and he only had back pain when he was running. So it paid off, and we want to think about creating foot, and we think of a bunion having a little kick. So we had ruled out that he was having uh, some sort of injury, if we want to call it that, or some sort of pathomechanics. What he was having was poor running mechanics that was leading to back pain. Uh, Scott, our patient here, is a CrossFitter. Uh, so he's doing high intensity interval training a couple times a week and really what was getting to him was those short intervals, 200s, 400s. In particular, as you can imagine, um, this is one of my few knocks on uh, HIT training like this or CrossFit is that we do heavy lifts or lifts to exhaustion and then we go run. So I always tell people CrossFit is not the greatest time to build great running form because you're typically going to run like crap. So. What we're going to look at, if we zoom in here real quick, we've got the left-hand side of the screen uh, for you guys. Right-hand side is the after. So we're going to go ahead and look at the left first. So if we just watch him run at full speed, we'll bring it back. It's not too bad, right? So we'll bring them both back. So what I want us to recognize here, and I'm gonna unlink these and get them synced up real quick. So we're gonna both be landing on that right foot. So we're about the same impact point. It's right about there, pretty good. So if we watch the left, there's a couple things going on here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and slow this down. So if we watch the point of impact. So one of the kisses of death for a runner is that we get that front leg completely straight. So if we draw this kind of just angle through here, we do not want to see that occurring at any point. So when this occurs, I call this kicking the soccer ball. So if we clear that out, if we back it up just a little bit, you're going to see as he swings through, his knee bends slightly, not a whole lot. The hip bends slightly, but then it's like he's winding up for a nice corner kick and he punts that soccer ball and then he reaches out with that heel and hard dorsiflexion and lands way back on the heel. So let's talk about one of the misconceptions real quick with uh, running gait and gait analysis overall is the fact that we think landing on our heel is the problem. And then we try to fix it by thinking about where we're going to land on our foot. That's not how you're going to fix this stuff. So landing on your heel throws a lot of impact up the kinetic chain. When we walk, there's about one times body weight. When we jog, there's about two times. When we run, there's about three times our body weight coming up at us. For every inch I move, ahead of my center of mass uh, when we're talking about placing your foot. So let's go ahead and measure Scott's angle of impact here from his hip, looking about 18 degrees. Normal would be about five degrees. So that's gonna put us, if we back this up and we draw our angle in, five degrees would put us somewhere about there. So you can see where we would want Scott's foot ideally to land under his center of mass, which is going to put his foot in a different landing position, but we're not going to focus on the foot. That's like focusing on the rose when the, the problem is the soil, right? We've got to get to the, the problem itself. So let's clear this out. So we see as he goes through, we get a straight knee. We're going to swing back through. We start to see that foam on his shoe compress about there, which we're just slightly bending the knee. We pull through, and then we do basically the same thing on the left side here. Now, the other thing to account for is let's look at the angle that occurs through his body. So we call this sitting in the saddle. So he's breaking at his hips. So he's creating more of a hip hinge. He's a good crossfitter, right? We've got a hip hinge going. But what we want with a runner is to actually be leading through the hips. So your hips should be driving the mechanism of force here, right? Our hips are our center of gravity. So if my center of mass is pushed back and my foot is pushed forward, you can imagine the amount of impact that's being driven up into his back, right? And uh, everybody has a dominant side when we're talking about gait. So that means we're going to spend a little more time, have a little more length on one side, and we're going to postulate that if we looked at him and did a second count, if we had something like an opto gait, that he's going to spend about 
maybe upwards of one and a half or two times more time on the, or in stance phase on this right side. So what did we do? We gave him a very simple cue. So if we move over to the right side here and look at this a little closer and play it at the same frame rate, you're going to see it looks not all that different, right? It's hard to fix a lot of stuff at once. We're trying to fix the big pieces. So he still kicks the soccer ball, but then we gave him a cue that if we look at his impact, his impact is a very different place or starts to change. So we see that his foot starts to shift more under his center of gravity. Draw my angle upside down there. So now we see, and again, this isn't super specific, but we're looking for that medial malleolus. So we shave a couple degrees off. Well, what's that do? It's going to push his center of mass back behind, or sorry, his foot back behind or under his center of mass. The other cool thing here is if we look at side by side, both of these, watch his, what's called his angle of return. So let's look at the left side, so the before. So this angle of return is very low. We get very little hip flexion, very little knee flexion. I like to measure this angle as well. So we put that up here and we're looking like 90 degrees. You look at an elite runner, we're going to be 35, 30, maybe 25 degrees there, which is going to be based on mobility and also speed. But then when we look at the return angle on the after, we start to see a little bit of a change, right? Nothing's like crazy here. We're just looking for the little bits of improvement, right? So we shave a couple degrees off this stuff. Well, what this does is create a shorter lever, right? So his angle of return creates something that's easier to create, uh, easier momentum with. But as we move his knee higher up in space, it allows him to drop his foot underneath his center of mass easier, like a hammer dropping down. So again, ideal world from this position, we would have Scott think, you're going to crush a bug under your foot, you're going to drop the anvil. What the cue I gave him was, was, hey, just think that your foot lands behind you. It's not going to happen, but what'd that do? It cued him up to get his foot under his center of mass and not worry about, am I landing forefoot, midfoot, all that fun stuff. That changed automatically. Now, the one thing that we want to say here is the caveat that could be the kiss of death with a case like this is, is he going to get what we call a calf pop? So is he going to leave his heel up in the air and ride on his toes, which he does a very good job of getting what we call a full foot landing, so an FFL, right? We don't want him up on his toes. We don't want to see space under that heel because what's he going to have? Achilles, calf issues, all those fun things. And probably the biggest point to take home here is I gave Scott a cue, but I also said you may find a cue that works better. You may have to think about driving your knee higher. You may think about crushing the bug because everybody's individual and just because I tell him think about your foot behind you that may not click with him so we gave Scott this cue we said hey we don't think anything really intrusive is going on with your back doesn't seem to change with any other movement we always do a full exam when we do a gait analysis so we're doing a top tier SFMA going through any orthopedic tests that we need to do to make sure that we're not just a treating an injury via running. Also, if I ask Scott to do this new movement or new piece of running, where I'm gonna force his foot more under his center of mass, and let's say he lacks ankle dorsiflexion, that's on me. I just messed up because now I'm telling him to ask his body to do something that it can't do. So we always rule that stuff out first. We're never just putting somebody on a treadmill, looking at what they do, and then trying to correct what they do with a coaching cue. So I hope that all makes sense. If you guys have any questions on gait analysis, oh, let's tell you the good news though. Scott went and ran for, I think a week or two, reported back, no pain. Hasn't had pain since. So is that a hooray for me? No, because we may get six months down the road and he may start having pain again because what's he gonna be able to do? He's gonna be able to run more. He's gonna be able to fatigue himself more by running more. And he may fall back into the same old pattern or find a different pattern because this is not optimized. Right? This just got him a little further down the road. That's like taking somebody that hinges through their lumbar spine, teaching them to hip or hinge through their hips. That doesn't mean they can deadlift 400. We still got stuff to work on. So as I was going to say, make sure that cues are specific to the athlete. Make sure that whatever you're asking the athlete to do, they can do, because that's my job as a chiropractor and a strength coach is to make sure I give them access if they need it. Um, but also, you have to be very detailed and have a needs-based assessment. What does Scott need to do? 
he ain't running a marathon. He needs to be able to run a 400 pain free and that may be a very different goal. Hope that helps. Send questions there if you got them. See you guys next time.